grace and peace to you. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, so glad to see all of you here. And slowly but surely, the Presbyterian Church of Dover South Campus, Florida, are coming home. Yes, it's about time. I know you all are going back, but at least I, I keep the rest of you here. You brought your own palms. Wow. Well, it is, it is good to see all of you here this morning. Uh, I call your attention to a few announcements as we get started. Uh, first of all, please do sign the pew pad along the center aisle, and then whoever's along the center, kindly tear that page out so that uh, others uh, who are collecting those may do so easily. If you're online with us today, please make a comment on Facebook or on YouTube so that we know you are worshiping with us. We do count our online attendees the same as we count those who come in person. If you should have a prayer that you would like for me to lift today, prayer cards are in the pew in front of you, and an usher will be by during the first hymn, uh, Prepare the Way O Zion, to collect those prayer cards. Uh, also, we note that the flowers uh, in the sanctuary, this arrangement, and there are a couple here and one out in the new narthex, are from Ed Gazy's Celebration of Life service yesterday, which was a wonderful celebration. And uh, thanks to all of you who were here, uh, those who were worshiping here and online, and especially to Pat Chapman, the deacons, and all of those who helped make the reception a real success. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, also, we have a visitor coming, uh, Heather Thompson, shared with me that, uh, I'm, I hope I don't mess this name up, Heather, Reverend Zachary Mboyamba? That's right. That's right. Woo! Uh, is, is coming to see us. And uh, he is from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And he'll be visiting our presbytery for several days. And especially will be visiting us here uh, at the Presbyterian Church of Dover on Wednesday, April 3rd, then that is at 10 a.m., um, and it'll just be a casual coffee and conversation. But we've got a dilemma. He's not bringing a translator. So if you happen to speak French, anybody? Anyone speak fluent French? Anybody? Okay. Well, we need someone who speaks fluent French. So if you know of anybody, please speak with Heather or speak with me so that we can uh, actually have a conversation with our guest. Um, and it does not say so in the announcement, but that will be here at the church in the library. Uh, coming ahead for the week, we have bells uh, tomorrow evening, prayer shawl on Wednesday, and a special choir rehearsal. Uh, that rehearsal is in lieu of rehearsing Thursday night because Thursday night is our Maundy Thursday service. And we would greatly appreciate your prayers as uh, we will be meeting a music director candidate this week. And uh, your prayers for that are much, much appreciated. Right, Betsy and Barb? Yeah. Yes, yes. And lastly, in case you did not know, this past week, March 20th, was Mr. Rogers' Day. It was the uh, anniversary of Mr. Rogers' birthday. As you know, Mr. Rogers was a Presbyterian minister. And uh, in celebration of his birthday, we are doing a two-week book study of a book titled Peaceful Neighbor, Discovering the Countercultural Mr. Rogers. I have 10 copies of the book available. When those 10 are gone, you'll be responsible for getting your own book, whether ordering a physical copy or uh, a digital copy. And you can see, you can see me or uh, message Karen. Uh, for more information on that. Uh, if you're going to see me today after worship to tell me this, write it down or it will not happen, okay? Jot it down on something for me. Um, but it's a two-part book, and we'll discuss one part on Wednesday, May 22nd, and one part on Wednesday, May 29th. So you will not want to miss this really cool discussion about who Fred Rogers was. And I believe that's all for announcements today. So let us center our hearts and minds for worship as the prelude is played.
Good morning. morning. Welcome to Presbyterian Church on this Palm Sunday, Passion Sunday, and the first Sunday of astronomical spring, so we're here. That's why all those folks from Florida finally came back. Please rise if you're able and join us in the call to worship. Sing songs of loudest praise. Sing songs that are unashamed. Sing songs without being afraid. Sing for the God of tomorrow and today. Let us worship the one worthy to be praised. Seated. Today, the Gospel of John tells us that crowds gathered to praise Jesus as he entered Jerusalem, singing and shouting with confidence. After describing the crowd, however, the Gospel writer zooms in on the disciples and tells us that while the crowds shouted praise at Jesus, The disciples were confused. The text says the disciples did not understand what was happening. A lot of our lives may look like this. Either we understand God's presence in our lives and want to shout it from the rooftop, or we're standing on the side of the parade missing our chance to sing. That is why we need a prayer of confession. Because life happens fast and without a doubt. We have stood where the disciples stood. So let us pray, for we don't want to miss our chance to sing. Holy God, we want to run into the streets and sing your praise. We want to be bold and unashamed of this good news gospel. However, too often we find ourselves standing against the wall. Too often we stay quiet. Too often we let others carry the song. Forgive us for the moments when we could lead the parade, but instead find ourselves standing on the sidelines. Show us which songs are ours to sing. Show us which parades are ours to lead. 
and then give us the courage and conviction to do both. With hope and honesty, we pray. Amen. Friends, no matter where you are on the parade route, whether you are waving palm branches through the streets or standing against the wall, quiet and cautious, Jesus marched for you. Jesus' love, his striving for justice and mercy, it was for you. You are included in this story, and nothing can ever change that. So hear these words and trust them deep in your bones. We have reason to sing, for Jesus Christ loved you yesterday. Jesus Christ loves you today, and Jesus Christ will love you tomorrow. You are forgiven, claimed, and sent to serve. So go out and sing. Go out trusting these words. Amen? Amen. Amen. of Christ to one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also, also with you. you. How are you, Jimmy? I have the answer tomorrow. I have the answer tomorrow. I think it's nothing like it.
time, I'll invite the children forward, and we're going to wait. Don't go for it yet, Regan. <laughs> come on forward. Any of our children, come on forward. Hello, hello. Now, Regan has gone searching for the heart every Sunday, but I want to see if I have someone else who wants to go searching for the heart today. Do you want to go? Do you want us to look for the heart? We're looking for one of those hearts. Like that. Yeah. Oh, hello. Welcome. Welcome. We're going to go find the heart. Are we ready? Let's go over here. We're not, we're not moving far, Marjorie, I promise. I got a strict talking to about staying in view of the camera, right? Do we see the heart anywhere along there? You see it over there. Oh, let's go get it. Did you? Oh, you saw it earlier. Okay, come on, Julia. Okay. Okay, you want to get it? Regan, show them how we get it off there. Because Miss Karen has to tape it or else it falls off. Now, stop. What is above it? What's the marking? This thing. Well, what is that thing? Well, do you know, there, there are two things there. Do you, do you see... One of the things that you know, what is it? It looks like it's a music note. It is a music note. And what's that other thing? Um, this looks like the greater sign. Okay. <laughs> yes. And in music, what do we call that? It's not a greater sign. On one note, it's called? Crescendo. No, on one note, it's called? An accent. An accent. An accent. And I think the best way to show you what an accent is, I want to play a piece of music, okay? It's really short. Come here. And I'm trying to see it on my phone because I forgot to print it out. Okay. Can you see that? Okay. It's, it's really tiny. Let's see. Okay. This, no one say or do anything when I announce the title. This is a piece by Franz Joseph Haydn. That's his name. And this piece is from Symphony Number no. 94, but we know it as the Surprise Symphony. Are you listening? Okay. Are, are you ready? Ready? <laughs> That's an accent. <laughs> Did you hear it? <laughs> that was it again. What did you hear before that? Quiet. It was very quiet. And he wrote this. It's a funny piece of music because we're just going along really quiet. And then all of a sudden, and some people think that Franz Joseph Haydn must have had a cat, and the cat jumped on the keyboard then. <laughs> but that's not true. That little note with the accent, like that, it's a surprise, right? You don't think it's coming because that song is so soft. It surprised us, and it can scare us. Well, a surprise happened in the scripture today. Jesus has a lot of people who are watching him. And they see that he is teaching them. And if they're ill, he's helping them feel better. And he is really, really popular. He's like a rock star popular. And people saw that he was going into Jerusalem, the big city. And he was coming in riding on something. What was he riding on? It wasn't a chicken. <laughs> what was he riding on? No. Nope. No. Nope. That was a really good guess. I was hoping someone would say it. It wasn't a horse. It was a donkey. And that was a big surprise. And all these people walking with Jesus, well, that was a big surprise. And 
Yeah, a donkey. And they had palm leaves like this and other branches from trees. And they were waving them to get Jesus' attention. And they were saying something. They were saying a word. Not here, chicken, chicken. I should have been a lawyer. What were they saying? Hosanna! Hosanna! Now, what do we think that word means? What do you think it means? It means what? Who told you that? No one told you that? Oh my goodness, you were right. When people were saying Hosanna, they weren't saying, hip, hip, hooray, it's Jesus. No, they were saying, save me or help me. The people wanted Jesus' help. And there were so many people that a parade started. They are walking along with Jesus. Jesus is on a donkey and they're waving their palms. Do you have your palms? You want to wave your palms? They're waving their, you're waving the palms and they're saying, Jesus, help us, help us. And that's what Jesus came to do. And this parade was a big surprise. <laughs> and this week we get more. Yeah. Well, this week we're going to hear more story about Jesus. And Jesus, at the end of the week, has to die. But next Sunday, Jesus isn't dead. And you have to come next Sunday to hear the rest of the story because it's <laughs> so super cool. But I don't want to ruin it. Okay? So I will see you all next week. Will you pray with me? Let's pray together. Loving God. Loving God. Thank you for surprises. And thank you for Jesus. We remember that parade long ago. And we know that you still help us. And we are so thankful for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So glad to see you all, and I hope to see you next week, because I hear uh, that there might be an Easter egg hunt next Sunday. Yeah, yeah, I think that's going to happen, right, Peggy? Isn't that happening, Julia? Yeah. So you don't want to miss that. I'll see you all next week, okay? How wonderful. Oh, yeah, we need to put that up on the table. Will you put that up there? Yeah, you can, you can go with him. Isn't it wonderful to see so many children this morning? Amen. Yes, indeed. Amen. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. That's what I was playing from. Please pray with me our prayer for illumination. I don't memorize. God of grace, your word is like a song. It is the melody that we long to sing. The refrain that we pray will get stuck in our heads. So as we return to scripture once more, we pray that you will allow us to sink into this song. Allow us to hear the truth in between the words. Allow the crowds of the crowds, Hosanna, to feel like our own. With open hearts and open ears, we pray. Amen. Today we continue in our series, Wandering Heart. And today we consider the theme, Songs of Loudest Praise. As most of you are aware, we're following along with the disciple Peter, understanding more about who Peter is and what his relationship was with Jesus and we're doing so not only through scripture, but also through a phrase of, of the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And today we sing songs of loudest praise, loud hosannas. Hear the story. The next day, the day after he was anointed by Mary, whose brother Lazarus, Jesus, had just brought back from the dead. 
The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's coat. His disciples did not understand that the, uh, these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, Then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. Though the grass may wither and the flowers may fade, the word of God endures forever. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Holy Lord, speak now your words to us in ways that we can hear you and understand you and be changed by you. And somehow, Lord, make my words your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we are here on this Palm Sunday, uh, just for the record, for those that like to keep track of these sorts of things, we are celebrating Palm Sunday only today. I do not want to shortchange Palm Sunday nor ruin the rest of the story that you do not want to miss on Thursday. And then again with a private devotion on Friday. And then world-changing news on Sunday. But we need to remember how all this began. We've been looking at Peter. There was an abundant catch of fish after a night of no fish. Because Jesus got on the boat and they went into the deep waters. And then they were called to follow Jesus. And Peter indeed followed. Peter then was invited to walk on the water, and he did. We make Peter an enemy by focusing on the fact that he went through the water. He didn't stay on the water. How many steps have you taken on water? Peter took more than you. And Peter clung to Jesus, who was his rescuer, his savior. Peter pronounced his faith confidently when Jesus wanted to know what the word was on the street about who he was and what the word was among the disciples about who he was. But then very quickly, he is told to get out of Jesus' way when he rebukes Jesus, when he tells for the first time of his upcoming suffering and death and resurrection. Peter then asks some questions about what forgiveness is and exactly how many times we have to forgive people. And he learns from Jesus about the expansiveness of grace. And now the end is near. And Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem on a coat of a donkey. But there's an obvious question that we have to wrestle with today. Where's Peter? If you look at the passage of Scripture that I read, it makes absolutely no mention of Peter by name. So where where is Peter? It reminds me of those Where's Waldo things, right? There are a million places that Peter could be. But in John's Gospel, when, and most of the Gospel writers for that matter, when the Gospel writer mentions the disciples, we generally assume that they're all there. Sometimes it'll say the disciples except four, which is the case for Thomas one time after Jesus is resurrected. And Thomas isn't in the group when Jesus comes into the room walking through the wall. And Thomas says, yeah, right, I believe you when I put my hand into his side. But generally speaking, when the disciples are mentioned by the disciples, we assume they're all there. But where exactly is Peter? You see, this is an ad hoc, very quick procession that is taking place. Knowing Peter's journey, the way that he has drawn closer to Jesus and then backed away, the way he's got it right and the way he's got it wrong, the times of sharp understanding who Jesus is and the times when Peter doesn't have a clue what's going on, we could guess where Peter might be. The Bible study group, most of the people in the Bible study group, when I asked that question, They thought Peter would either be somewhere in the middle. Bill specifically said the third row. (laughs) 
Or maybe Peter wasn't marching along at all, but rather standing on the sidelines, cautious, confused, wondering what in the world is happening. But we have to understand the events just prior to this passage. Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead, a passage I preached yesterday at Ed's service. But that intensifies the plot to kill Jesus. If you remember back many weeks ago, there was the encounter with Jesus and the disciples where Peter claimed, you are the Messiah. And Jesus said, don't tell anyone. They weren't even near Jerusalem. They were in a Gentile village at that point because it was not time for Jesus' identity to be widely known. So they went off to the land of the Gentiles where they could talk openly and safely. But now Jesus' time has come. From this point on, Jesus faces Jerusalem, and Jesus faces what is inevitably his death. And he faces it with courage. But because Jesus has made a splash and has been healing people and now raising someone from the dead, those who are out to get him are really out to get him. He is threatening the power structures of the day. Jesus at one point Later in uh, the chapter 11, after the situation where he brings Lazarus back to life, Jesus has to escape into the wilderness with his disciples. The crowds begin to question whether Jesus really is the Messiah. The powers of Rome were not pleased because Jesus was getting a lot of attention, and the only attention that should be given is to Caesar. They wonder if Jesus is going to attend the Passover festival. And as it draws near, Jesus comes out of the wilderness and he travels into Bethany. And he, indeed, is lavished with care by Mary. Again, Mary, whose brother Lazarus, Jesus had just raised from the dead. Mary anoints Jesus' feet with the herbs and oils used to prepare a body for burial a foretelling of what's to come. But Judas, the one who is to betray Jesus by the end of this week, does not like this wastefulness. That could have been sold, Judas says. The writers this week in the commentary say, given the swelling emotional intensity of these events, how do you imagine Peter feels as he stands among the crowds? Does, does he feel exuberant to witness their praise? Does he feel skeptical and scared of anyone who might be trying to arrest Jesus? Is he thinking about when Jesus rebuked him? Is he still wishing that Jesus' words about his upcoming suffering and death will not come true? Regardless, the crowds that day gathered, and they shouted their hosannas, but the disciples did not understand these things. Dr. Caroline Lewis writes, the misunderstanding is a common theme in John, and rightly so. We are not supposed to comprehend that God, the great I Am, came to dwell with us in the flesh of a human body. And at this point in the story, it is not possible to grasp what Jesus' kingship is all about. Yet to come will be his arrest, trial, crucifixion, resurrection, and the promise of his ascension. The fullness of grace upon grace will only be realized once Jesus returns to the Father to prepare a dwelling place for us, John's Gospel says. It's no wonder the disciples couldn't understand. We wouldn't either. If this is truly the Messiah, the one to continue the line of David, the one to right the wrongs of a government gone bad, Jesus can't die like this. He's only in his early 30s. Then they remembered. Dr. Lewis writes, isn't that how, it often, how often things work in life and in faith? Hindsight is 2020. But John is not exactly clear as to what the disciples actually remembered. There's a kind of suspension of normal time in this Palm Sunday. We're looking forward to the events of Holy Week, yet we also know how the story ends. And we view all that happened through a resurrection lens. Today, we're invited in this passage to set that lens aside, to pretend that we don't know the rest of the story or else we miss the scandal. 
We have watered down the Palm Sunday parade and we have turned it into a mini Easter celebration. And many of us will not want to face the reality of what's coming this week. If you don't believe me, look at church attendance around the country and see the numbers fall for Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. We want to jump from a parade, a hip hip parade that we've made up in our minds and rush over to Easter Sunday because we don't want to be made uncomfortable by death. This is not a ticker tape and candy parade, friends. This is not about rejoicing. Palm Sunday, Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem is a rebellious act, a protest. The Romans would add extra forces during the high holy days, especially Passover. They did not want rabble-rousing, and they did not want the Jewish people to get too much power. Rome wanted all control. Jesus' act of rebellion and opposition would have been a slap in the face to Caesar. Rome rode in on mighty horses. Jesus rode in on a donkey. Rome rode in from the west. Jesus rode in from the east. Rome rode in with power and might. Jesus came with peace and humility. Rome rode in with shouts of Hail Caesar. Jesus rolled in with cries, Save us, Lord. Rome would not have liked Jesus' actions. Caesar was not one to share the spotlight. People crying out to Jesus to save them indicates that they view him as some sort of higher power. They view him as a king, if nothing else. They view him as one with the power to change their situation. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The God of our ancestors has sent you to us. Hosanna, save us. If we understand the events that took place in the city of Jerusalem that we mark on Palm Sunday, we're left with tension. Jesus, the rabble rouser, brings his posse of rebels, outcasts, sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes, and fishermen, and they cause quite a stir. They've all literally put their lives on the line by being seen with this man, Jesus. And many would later face death because of it. Today we're invited to consider Peter and how, yet again, we are like Peter. While we may not understand the necessity of Jesus entering Jerusalem like this, it was all part of God's plan for the Messiah, a plan foretold by the prophets, but a plan that people greatly misunderstood. And we don't understand we prefer to blend in rather than stand out, right? We might at best be on the third row of the parade lineup, or we may be hiding behind a tree, watching with amusement and curiosity, but fear. We don't like conflict, and we avoid it at all costs, and we probably would not have pushed up against the powers of the day. We aren't always sure where and how we fit in to God's larger story, so we hold all of this tension. And we hold that tension as we enter into Holy Week. We hold the tension as we wait to hear the stories of Maundy Thursday, the brutality and the suffering of Jesus on Good Friday, the silence on Saturday. Let's not skip ahead to Easter, friends. Let's not skip the parts of the story that are hard to hear. You see, friends, we cannot get to the glory of the resurrection without facing the brutality and reality of Jesus' death. We cannot get to the alleluias of Easter morning until we hear the words coming this week, Hosanna, crucify him. But the question remains, where would we be in the parade? Where would we be in this grand rebellious procession knowing that being with Jesus is a risk to our very lives? Where would we be? And where will we be for the rest of the story that continues on Thursday? I pray you'll be here 
It's a story worth hearing. Praise be to God. Amen. Amen. Let us respond to those words by rising, if you're able, and saying together the affirmation of faith. We believe in Jesus of Nazareth, who rode through the streets of Jerusalem on a donkey. We believe in Jesus of Nazareth, who challenged Rome's oppressive power with peaceful protest. We believe in Jesus of Nazareth, who was surrounded by crowds of dreamers and believers. We believe in Jesus of Nazareth, so even today we will sing songs of loudest praise. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Before we move to the prayers of the people, uh, we have a special prayer that we're going to offer today. And uh, could I have a, a few volunteers to come and hold up some of these prayer shawls? Jimmy, would you grab a couple? Would you come and hold a couple? Thank you. Yeah. If, if you'll just take a couple of these in your hands. We have a prayer shawl ministry, and the folks who uh, knit and crochet come together uh, twice a month. And they sit in the library and have great conversation, and they've let me come in and chat while they work. And they make these beautiful prayer shawls. And these have been made for some time, but we realized that they had not been blessed. So the Bible study group blessed one to get it over to Ed Gazy a couple of weeks ago. But we wanted to make sure that we bless the rest of these. So that's what we're going to do. And I'll grab one myself. Let us, let us pray. Oh God, we give you thanks and praise for the gifts of the people of this church and today especially for those who make these prayer shawls. And Lord, we pray a blessing over them. 
that the ones who may receive these may feel the warmth of your embrace and may be reminded of our love for them too. No matter what they face, O Lord, wrap them in your love. Grant them your healing mercy. Grant them your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, friends. And if you know someone in our church family who may benefit from a prayer shawl, please let me know, or you can always also ask Evie, who is, uh, I guess, the leader of those who are uh, making these. And also, you could always see Pat, who is moderator of the deacons. Let us move into prayer. Jesus suffered death and rose to glory for the life of the world. Let us lift up our hearts in thanks to God and pray for the cares of the world, saying, Save us, O Lord, for your mercy is great. Save us, O Lord, for your mercy is great. Holy God, your Son humbled himself even to death to show us the power of loving service. Guide those holding positions of power that their decisions give rise to the mutual flourishing of the world you so love. Save us, O Lord, for your mercy is great. Healing God, your Son is betrayed and crucified in our violent world each day. Raise us to a new and rightly ordered world through the reconciling love of Christ where all victims of violence, persecution, shame, or terror may stand together with you in peace. Save us, O Lord, for your mercy is great. Forsaken God, as your Son suffered his cruel death on the cross, darkness covered the whole land. Enlighten us to care for your creation. Awaken us from our denial and abuse and help us to alleviate its suffering. Save us, O Lord, for your mercy is great. Grieving God, your Son consoled others in life and in death. We pray for all who are distressed, broken, sorrowful, and mourning, especially the family of Ed Gazy and the family of Vincent Pietricatella, Anthony's cousin who died this week. We pray, O oh Lord, for these who are mourning and grieving that together with Christ and his suffering, we all may be healed and raised in you. Save us, O oh Lord, for your mercy is great. Eternal God, your son was lovingly cared for as he was laid to rest in a tomb we remember before you those who have died and pray for those who may die today. Enfold them in your love that they may rest and rise with Christ forever in his light. Save us, O Lord, for your mercy is great. And ever listening, God, we lift to you the prayers that are on our prayer concern list for so many of our dear friends and family. We also lift up in prayer Addie Babis. We also lift in prayer the lands around the world that are struggling with war and violence, especially Israel, the situation in Gaza. We pray for Palestinians. We pray for peace, O oh Lord. We pray for the citizens of Ukraine and Russia. We pray for those in Sudan. We pray for those impacted by the ISIS attack in Russia. We pray for the people and the church in Armenia and Sudan and Yemen. We pray for our friend who will come here from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And we humbly pray for our church that as your messengers in this time, in this place, we may bear the weight of the cross of Christ as we share your love with others. Move us into the parade, O Lord. Give us courage not to stand by and do nothing, but like Jesus, take on the cause of the poor, 
the ill, the oppressed. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven. The usher will now come forward to receive our tithes and offerings. If you have not already placed your gift in the plate that was outside before the worship, please raise your hand. The usher will be by to collect your gift. As always, you can uh, give online by visiting doverpresbyterian.org. With joy and gratitude, let us pray together the prayer of thanksgiving. God of abundant grace, we turn our wondering hearts to you and offer you all that we have and all that we are, gifts of paper and coin, gifts of talent and time, gifts of tenderness and trust. Tune our hearts to sing your praise and to return to you. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Beloved wanderer, as you leave this place, may you carry your curious heart on your sleeve. May you look for God in every face. May you find the courage to get out of the boat, to run to the tomb, and to speak of your faith. And when the world falls apart, may you hear God's voice deep within saying, Take heart, it is I, be not afraid. You are called. You are blessed. In both your ups and your downs, you always belong to God. Go now in peace. Go trusting that good news. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.